Nice here. Welcome back to another Color Theory episode. I was working on the 1.21 color world, and there's a feature that I'm adding that I thought kind of deserved its own little episode. When picking blocks for a palette, it's not good enough just to look at the average color. There are a lot of other things you have to consider. One of those things is something I'll just call texture noise. If you look at these three blocks, they all have almost the exact same average color. If you look at them in a color space, they're all kind of just on top of each other with all of these other neutral colored blocks. Even though they're just a few percentage from each other, I wouldn't call them interchangeable in a build. I made some extreme examples here. All of these blocks have the same average color. They all average out to be this middle gray color. So what I want to do is to try to find a way to actually quantify this and have it selectable inside the color world. If you look at just the copper ore here, we can place all the individual colors that make up the block into the color space as well. And you can kind of see their spatial distribution. We can do the same thing for the dead coral block. And everything's just kind of in a line here. If we do the same thing for the gray concrete, then almost everything is self-contained inside the block. There's very little variation here. So how do we go about quantifying this? Let's go back to the copper ore and look at all the individual colors. I would call this block noisy. And if you look at each of the individual pixel colors in the color space, they have physical locations and we can calculate their distance from the average color. In general, when done with two colors, this is just called the color difference. We could do that for every pixel in the block, sum all of those values, and then divide by the total number of pixels. And that would give us a single number representing the average color distance of the block. Noisy blocks would have high values and more uniform blocks would have low values. I wrote a script that does all of that. And right now I'm just doing blocks with the same texture on each side. So now I can run a function that distributes them in kind of a graph based on their total color difference. And we'll fly down there to get a better view. Everything's very stacked up. So I'm gonna do something that kind of separates them out. One second. Okay, I'm just separating them out a bit um, some of them are still going to be stacked on top of each other, but the vertical axis doesn't mean anything right now. It's just very similar colors on this end, and then it should get more noisy as we get further out. I see I have a problem here. This is supposed to be the inside mushroom. One second. Let me fix that. Okay. I think I fixed it. All right. Yeah, there it goes. All right. So blocks should be less noisy and they get more noisy, more texture variation as we move right. So yeah, this looks pretty good. Still a bunch of things stacked on top of each other, but that's fine. Um, yeah, let me get to the weirdos down here. Ore blocks, terracotta, as expected. But this isn't actually everything. There's still another thing that I want to try to quantify better. And so I made some other extreme examples to demonstrate. All these blocks have the same exact average color, but they also contain the same number of black and white pixels, which means that they also have the same average color difference. And these blocks would have very different uses in a build. What made me think about this was the side of the observer and the skulk catalyst. These are great blocks to use just in certain cases. They have these groups of colors that make them stand out against other blocks, even of similar average color. The observer has this dark gray and these two lighter gray bands and the catalyst has this dark blue on top and kind of this yellowish green on the bottom. There might be some term for this in art and color theory, but I'm not familiar with it. And there's probably a way to quantify it, but it's fun to try to figure things out yourself too. And so we started looking at image kerneling. Normally kerneling is used for things like blurring. You are affecting a pixel's value based on its neighboring pixels. This is how you do blurring, emboss, outline, sharpen, all of that stuff. You're affecting the original pixel based on its neighboring pixels. And while it's not exactly what I need, I think I can use something like it. If you look at this little blue pixel here, I'm interested in how similar all of its neighbors are compared to it. So what I thought I could do is take a look at the neighboring pixels in like a five by five grid and calculate the difference between the center pixel and the neighboring pixels. I can sum all those values and then divide by 25 and then iterate over the whole block doing the same thing, summing all those values and then dividing by 256. I think this would give me a value that is smaller for large groups of color and larger for small groups of color. Something like this note block, even though it's noisy, the noise averages out over a relatively small area. And so I wrote a script that does that for me. And 
So now we can actually add a vertical axis to our distribution over here. So we're still gonna have low noise over here, uh, high noise over here, and then I guess what I'll call kernel noise will be low values down at the bottom and high values up the top. And let's see what it looks like. So it's not a linear line, which is good. That means it's doing something. But yeah, so there's a general broadening of textures going up, and that's fine. I want to look at the ones that are kind of like on the edges to see what it's actually doing, if it's doing things right. So something like this redstone block, it has a gradient from this lighter red to darker red. So the individual kernels, you're not going to have very much change, and so it's having a, it has a low value, which that makes sense to me. The skulk block and the mushroom block, it has, uh, it's relatively uniform except with these sharp uh, edges of color here. And so everything around here, you're gonna generate a high value even though it's low noise overall. So that makes sense to me also. Same for the skulk, it's a little bit more noisy, a little bit less uniform and so it's down and lower. And the diamond block is confusing to me. It's, I guess it has a pretty decent amount of change along the edges and everything like that. So I think there's more work to be done on this second part. I'm, and I'm not sure how useful it would be actually in the color world because I think if you are a builder, you, you generally have an understanding that you're not just using the average color and that these other um, more unique blocks that have different colors or different areas of color are, you know, not interchangeable with like these other ones. I think incorporating a noise filter will be pretty easy into the color world. I say easy, but it's not too bad. Um, and that way you can actually select like, hey, only show me blocks below, um, I don't know, some arbitrary value. This is, I normalized all this from zero to 100. And so like I could do deviations between, you know, 25, 50, and like 75 or something, even though it looks like Almost everything is below 50%. Uh, I'll have to like look at some graphs to actually see how everything's distributed. Some, uh, some good old bar graphs or something. But I actually might include this display in the color world as an option that you can just display blocks by, by noise and some other things. Maybe if I can think of some other ways of differentiating these blocks or I'm sure some viewers have better ideas of how to do this than I do. So if you do have those ideas, let me know. And uh, if it's a simple, relatively simple calculation um, or, you know, make a script for it, then I can implement it in the color world maybe. So I would like to work on this idea more. I definitely think that there is improvement to be made on like the different quantifying the different types of noise in blocks for builds and everything. And uh, it's something that I'm going to work on in the future because I am out of time right now. Uh, basically, as soon as I get done recording and editing this episode, I am leaving for two weeks of field work in Montana, doing some paleontology work, and um, I've just been incredibly busy with a lot of other things in my life uh, recently, and so I haven't made a lot of good progress on videos and everything. But I hope to, as soon as I get back, I hope to actually get hard at work at finishing this next geology video that I'm doing and working on the final version of the 1.21 color world, which I'll be excited to have out. So I hope this was interesting for somebody and uh, I'll have some longer meteor episodes when I get back. I hope you have a nice day and I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, nice here. I'm working on the next geology video, but something that got added in 1.26 we can now add a transparency value to the entity effect part, which is cool, but it's the format that is great. You set the RGB with values from 0 to 1, and then also the alpha for transparency is set from 0 to 1. You can do the same thing with dust particles, except they have no alpha, so they only have RGB values from 0 to 1. The strange part is that this format for defining color is not used anywhere else in the game. There are basically six different types of things that a player can create and define this color. And right now, each one of those uses their own unique format. The most basic of these is the glow effect. Normally, if you apply the glowing effect, it has a white outcome. But you can change that to be a team. 
and then you can set that game card to one of 16 written word colors. So now I have a pop up. And this is different from the theme main color. You can change that color, and it does not affect the glow color. 